Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Peace Lutheran Church. It is such a blessing to be here with you today, especially as this is uh, an important celebration for us. This is Confirmation Sunday. I think we've pushed this date back maybe four different times. <laughs> I think we've rescheduled this uh, as we've tried to find a day when we could do this together. Because, honestly, that's what confirmation is about. It, it, it's about being together. It's about seeing some people come up and proclaim, not their worthiness before God, but to remind each other how, in their commitment to their Lord and to their faith, they do it because they know their God is committed to them. And we do it together at a local church because we want to be committed to one another. But just as God showed us grace, not because of how worthy we are, but because he chose to love us, that in forgiveness and faithfulness, God is there for us. We want to be there for each other. And that's why we do this. This is why we do church. This is why we gather together. This is why we want to grow together. This is why we commit to the mission of going together. It's because we like being together. <laughs> And so I'm so thankful to be able to celebrate this with you today as we have five teens come forward who had completed our two-year starting point program. And they're going to get to talk about some of the things that they learned today in the examination portion of the service. And then later on in the service, after the sermon for the day, we'll get to have not just the teens, but four adults come forward too who had completed our, our Faith Builders Bible class. That as they come forward and, and announce together with us their, their unity and faith, that what they've learned and what they've seen and what they've walked through with me, it's, it's what they believe, it's what they love, just as you believe and love it too. And so they're committed to this ministry at peace, just as you are committed to it, and, and that together we can be united under the gospel of Christ. This is a good day. Everything you need to know for the worship service, you can find right here in the worship folder. You can also find it projected up on the screen. Please note that we're also live streaming the service. And so if you're watching this from home, please note that in the video description, you can find a link to an online version of the worship folder as well. Now with that said, may God bless your worship. And let's begin with the first hymn of the day.
invite you to participate with me in worship today by reading the word bold in your worship folder or up on the screen and, and joining with me in song when it's directed. As we come before God in worship, I ask you to please stand. And so we begin today in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Surely it is God who saves me. For the Lord is my stronghold and my sure defense. Whom have I in heaven but you? My flesh and my heart may fail. love in the Lord. Let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Heavenly Father has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for planting in us the seed of your word. By your Holy Spirit, help us to receive it with joy and to bring forth fruits in faith and hope and love. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Since our God reveals himself to us through his word, it's to that word we turn now as we see how that gift of faith and unity comes to us, that it comes through that word. <laughs> through God's powerful gospel, God works his goodwill in the world and, and thankfully in our lives. That, that his word always goes out and accomplishes his plan and and that the goal of that, the purpose of that plan is that we could celebrate in joy and in peace with our God and his kingdom. This is what the prophet Isaiah tells us in our Old Testament lesson as he reminds us of that promise of God that's attached to his word. So please follow along as you read from Isaiah chapter 55. As the rain and, sn as the rain and the snow come down from heaven... And do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. 
so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush will grow the juniper, and instead of briars the myrtle will grow. This will be the Lord's renown for an everlasting sign that will endure forever. This is the word of God. So we give thanks to God that, that the reign of his word it waters the seed of faith in our own hearts. It strengthens our trust, strengthens our faith so that we can know the joy and the peace that, that Christ came to win for us. In our second lesson, it, it, it gives the account of the Apostle Paul and how he went and scattered that seed of the gospel to all those around him. But God's word, when it goes out, sometimes, sometimes it doesn't produce the fruit that we would expect, the, the type of success that we would visibly want to see. Because God's word isn't about uh, making it look successful in this world. God's word simply does his will. And as the seed is scattered, not all want to hear it. The Apostle Paul, as he could have been discouraged and he could have been fearful of, of what those who heard it and didn't want to hear it, what they could have done for him, the Apostle Paul instead turns to God in trust. Knowing that the seed of faith planted in his heart is watered by God's promises and that, that God always provides opportunities to, to yield the abundant fruit that he has planned. So please follow along as you read this account of the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 18. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them. Because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent of it. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titius Eustace, a worshiper of God. Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord. Many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed. And were baptized. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you. And no one is going to attack and harm you. Because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half. Teaching them the word of God. This is the word of God. And so we see how that powerful word of God impacts people. A, a people that maybe at first nobody would have thought would have wanted to hear that word. And, and not only did they hear it, but they loved it. As the Spirit worked in their hearts, that faith, they, they grew to cling to it. And, they, and as they clung to it, they studied it. They wanted to learn more and more. This is what a faith wants. We, we don't want to just have the seed planted in our hearts, but we want to keep watering it with the word and, and keep digging into it and keep growing as we live a life that produces fruits to God's glory. God's glory. It's to this end that we're going to pause and invite our teen confirmants today as they get to express to us the things that they've dug deeply into. That over the last couple of years in our starting point program, they got to learn a lot about who God is, what he does, and, and who he made them to be. And so I invite those teen confirmants to come up on the stage at this time. Over here, make sure you watch that cord. We have them spread out a bit. Uh, so that they can not wear masks up here and approach the microphone and make sure that, that you all can hear clearly, right, clearly, <laughs> what they have to say and answer to a series of questions. I have a total of, of 35 questions to ask them. 
Uh, so that comes out to seven questions each that they're going to answer. And then at the end of it, they have a verse that they specifically chose themselves. A verse that they chose that they find personally helpful and important as they consider their life of faith. And finally, this is why we call the class that, that they go through starting point. Because the class that they've gone through is just a start. <laughs> They didn't learn everything about God. They didn't learn everything about their faith. This is just the beginning. So they can, they can have the initial tools to, again, understand who God is, what he's done, and who he's made them to be. So I thank you for coming up here today, and, and God's blessings to you as you answer these questions. Our first set of questions are questions concerning the nature of God. Abby, if you could step forward to the microphone. Question number one. Who are the members of the Trinity? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Correct. As we consider the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Duncan, we have an important question for you. Question number two. True or false? These are three separate gods who are one in purpose. False. The Trinity is one God with three distinct persons. Thank you. You can go back to your spot. That is, that's the thing that we spent a lot of time on as we discussed the Apostles' Creed. Uh, an important thing to understand as we contemplate our God who is not like anything else in this world. But just as our God is not like anything else in the world, our, as our God came to us in the flesh, our Savior, He's not like anything else either. Julie, if you can step forward. What does the dual nature of Christ refer to? True man and true God. Thank you. And so Jesus, when he came, he was unlike anybody else before him too because he was at the same time 100% true God and also 100% true man. These things we could not decipher on our own. We needed God's word to reveal them to us. And so our next set of questions are questions concerning the nature of the Bible. Alexis, if you could step forward for question number four. What are the two main teachings of the Bible? Thank you. Correct. Let's talk about that law and gospel. Hunter, if you could step forward for question number five. What is the main purpose of the law? Uh, show Correct. That's important teaching number one. Abby, next one. What is the main purpose of the gospel? Show your Savior. Thank you. We learned a little acronym to go with law and gospel. SOS show, uh, shows our sin for law and shows our Savior for gospel. Uh, may seem like simple things, but honestly, when you study the word, all of God's word falls into these two categories law and gospel. And, and they're both important, they're both equally true. And so as we read the whole Bible, even though it challenges us and, and it confronts things that maybe we don't always want to listen to, we have an important understanding of what the Bible is. Uh, Duncan, if you could step forward to question number seven. What are we referring to when we say that the Bible is the inspired and inerrant word of God? It was inspired by the Holy Spirit and it's all true. Thank you. And so as we can contemplate the Bible, and even though it challenges us, it, we know it's a gift of God, that even though people wrote it down, the Holy Spirit wrote down those words through those people, and so we trust all of it. And that's so necessary because what it reveals to us is the nature of our salvation. <laughs> this is why we have faith, is so that we know we are saved by God. And so the next set of questions all have to do with the nature of salvation. We get step forward for question number eight. True or false, sin is simply a bad action that we do. False, it must be that God's words are given. Thank you. When we contemplate the nature of being saved, we know that there's something we need to be saved from. And the Bible calls that sin. And sin, it's, it's so much more than just the naughty things we sometimes do. Jesus taught that it runs so much deeper. It runs into our very hearts, our very... Our very heart, uh, our very minds, our thoughts and feelings, it, it's all of it. But, but even deeper still, sin, the problem of sin runs. Alexis, if you could step forward for question number nine. What does sinful nature refer to? Sin Thank you. You can step back. The Bible also discusses sinful nature as the sin we're born into. That sinful people give birth to sinful people, and so we're born into a broken relationship with God. 
And so there's only one thing that God could use to save us, and, and it's grace. Hunter, if you could step forward for question number 10. You define the word grace. Close. We're going to get to justified later. Grace has to do with love. What kind of love? A love that you earn? It's a love. It's. I'm going to give you a help here, Hunter. It's un. Undeserved love. Thank you. You can go back to your spot. Undeserved love because it's a love that we couldn't earn. It's a love that we couldn't prove ourselves worthy for. It's a love that God had to choose to show. And he showed that grace and undeserved love most clearly in Christ as our substitute. Ab, if you could step forward for question number 11. In regards to Jesus being our Savior, what does it mean that he was our perfect substitute? He completely met God's demand in our place. Thank you. That is correct. And, and so as God in his holiness demanded perfection, not to be better than our neighbor, but to be perfect as he is perfect. And when we're not perfect, when we sin, he demands punishment for sin. What our Savior came to do was to meet those demands in our place. To be perfect in our place and to suffer the punishment of sin in our place. How did he go about that? Duncan, that's the next question. Question number 12. What are the three parts of how Jesus saved us as our perfect substitute? He lived a perfect life in our place, suffered the punishment of sins in our place, and conquered death in our place. Thank you. And so Jesus, when he was born perfect, but even though he was perfect, he died on the cross. And even though he died, he didn't stay dead. He rose from the dead. This is how Jesus saved us as our substitute. But now a, a word that, that Hunter brought up before, the word justification is the result of Jesus as our substitute. But what does it mean? Uh, Julie, if you could come forward. Define the word justification. To be declared not guilty. Thank you. Now, this is a joyous term, a courtroom term, that because of Christ we are declared not guilty. But what does that mean then for how we live and how we live as justified people? Alexis, step forward. True or false? By obeying the commandments better, I can increase my justification. False, because you That is correct. And because of Christ, we are already not guilty in Christ. We're not just a little bit not guilty. We're, we're all the way not guilty. These are either one or the other, and God declares us justified in his sight. We can't make ourselves more not guilty. But then it leads us to another important word in the Bible, sanctification. Hunter, if you could step forward for question number 15. You define the word sanctification. Well, it's different than justify. I'll give you a, a hint. You take something and you put it over here. You remember this one? Oh, it's... Can you think of what does the word holy mean? Remember that one? That's okay. It's to be set apart. To be made holy. So thank you. Good try. You can go back to your spot, okay? You're coming up with some more. We're coming up with some more. But sanctify, sanctification, what it means is to take something that's sinful and set it apart from that sin, to make it holy, to set it apart from that. And so we have an important question about sanctification then as we live a, a, a life uh, of setting our life apart from that sin and showing a life that, that looks that way. Abby, if you could step forward for question number 16. True or false, growing in my life of sanctification makes God love me more. False, he perfectly loved us dead in our sins. When we were dead in our when sins. We yeah, exactly. That is perfect. You go back to your spot. <laughs> I didn't mean to like, get back to your spot, Abby. No, that was good. <laughs> God already perfectly loved us when we were dead in our sins. And, and, and so living a life where we set our, our, our life away from sin and get better about avoiding sin, that doesn't make God love us more. God already perfectly loved us. So that begs the question, Duncan, number 17. 
Why do we keep God's commandments? So we can show our love and forgiveness to God, or thanks to God and love to strengthen our faith, and His commandments are for our own good. Thank you. Thank you. That's right. We, we show our love and thankfulness back to God when we keep his commandments. And, and His commandments aren't there to, to keep us from good things. His commandments are there to lead us to the better things that He has planned for us. And one of the, one of the most important commandments that we are given has to do with idolatry. Julie, if you could step forward. What does the word idolatry mean? Love anything more than God. Thank you. And so idolatry is more than just having a statue in your house. It, it it can be loving the bad things that God doesn't want us to, but it can also be loving the good things in our life more than God. And so when you look at it that way, we realize we have a life of repentance to live. Alexis, if you could step forward for question number 19. What does the word repent mean? That's right. Thank you. So repent literally means to turn around, but there are three important steps to repentance that we think about what what healthy repentance is about. Hunter, if you could step forward for question number 20. What are the three healthy parts of repentance? Uh, to, confess, to confess your sin, to, to trust in Christ for forgiveness, and to leave your sin. Nailed it. Thank you. Three healthy parts of repentance that we're not just sorry for a sin and wallow in that sorrow, but we trust that, the trust that Christ forgives us and we want to leave that harmful sin behind. This is the life that we live as children of God. But this whole time we know that repentance isn't what makes us children of God. It, it, it's, it's one thing that, that we are given that connects us to the blessings of Christ. Abby, if you could step forward for question number 21. What does God use to connect us to all these blessings Christ won for us? Thank you. The, the only one, one word answer in the whole thing. Faith is what connects us to the blessings of Christ. And so faith is very, very important. Duncan, if you could step forward. How do we obtain faith? The Holy Spirit gives faith through the gospel. Thank you. It, so as we heard before from Isaiah 55, it, it's through God's word, specifically through the gospel, that the Holy Spirit works and plants that faith and, and, that, and that gospel comes to us through what we call the means of grace. Uh, Julie, if you could step forward. What are the means of grace? The gospel working through the word and the sacraments. Thank you. This is how we interact with the things that God promises to use to plant faith and to nurture faith. And so our next set of questions are about that word that Julia said, the, the sacraments. Alexis, if you could step forward. What are the three requirements for a sacred act to be considered a sacrament? Um, instituted by Christ, earthly act of elements, and connects us with faith, faith, life, and forgiveness. Yeah, there you go. You got all three. And, and so there, there are lots of, of good things to do in the Bible, but, but the sacraments are things that Jesus said, this is what the New Testament church will do. And it uses things that we can see and touch. And most importantly of all, God promises that, that there's real forgiveness and new life and salvation connected in these sacraments. What are these two sacraments? Hunter, if you get some forward. That's your question. What are the two sacraments? Uh, there you go. Thank you. Those, according to the definition that we use, those are the two sacraments in our church. Now, let's talk a little bit about those sacraments. Abby, if you could step forward for a true or false question. True or false, the purpose of baptism is to take an opportunity to commit our lives to Christ. False. Baptism is about God washing us in His forgiveness and adopting us in Thank you. It, the two wonderful blessings we find in baptism, that God, God brings real forgiveness there, really washes us clean of our sin, and, and doesn't just send us to go live a life on our own, but brings us into his family. Um, Don't give you get step forward. Let's talk a little bit more about baptism. What gives baptism its power to grant forgiveness, new life, and salvation? The Holy Spirit working through the water and the word. Thank you. And, and, and that's why in baptism we, we see it as a miracle because the Holy Spirit is truly working there. But now what about the other sacrament, communion? 
Uh, Julie, if you could step forward. What does the doctrine of the real presence refer to? The body, blood, bread, and wine of Jesus are all present during the Lord's Thank you. It, all four elements are there. As the body is in with and under the bread, and, and Christ's blood is in with and under the wine in communion. All, all four of these things are truly present and come to us in communion. Now, what about the good of communion, the good of the Lord's Supper? Alexis, if you could step forward. What is one way the Lord's Supper benefits us? Yeah, there's a unity that we celebrate there. Thank you. Uh, there's a unity we celebrate in the Lord's Supper. You could also say another blessing that's found in communion is that it strengthens our faith. It assures us of the forgiveness of sins we have in Christ. Is that, that body and blood touches us, we know that the forgiveness belongs to us. Now, as we're called Peace Lutheran Church, and as we studied Martin Luther's small catechism, we also learned a bit about what makes the Lutheran Church unique. And so we're going to have some questions now at the end here about Lutheranism specifically. Hunter, if you could step forward, please. What event do we typically credit with the start of the Lutheran Reformation? There you go. Thank you. It's Martin Luther nailed these 95 theses uh, to a castle church door, sparking a debate that would also go on to spark this Reformation. Um, Abby, if you could step forward, please. In what year did that event take place? October 15th, Oh, you got the numbers turned around. Not 1570. There you go, 1517. There, <laughs> October 31st, 1517 is when Martin Luther nailed those 95 theses. Uh, but it wasn't just in order, uh, with, or the benefit of it, it wasn't just these 95 theses. It was a refocus on important things for both the whole church and Christians as individuals. Duncan, if you could step forward. The way the Reformation Church summarized what they wanted this Reformation to be about, it, they talked about three solas. Duncan, what are the three solas of the Lutheran Reformation? Grace alone, Scripture alone, and faith alone. Thank you. Now, let's talk about what each of those solas or alones mean. Julie, if you could step forward. What does grace alone refer to? We are saved only because of God's love. Thank you. It, it's not because we looked worthy enough in, in God's eyes, but it's because of that grace, because of that undeserved love that God saves us. Alexis, please step forward for the next one. What does Scripture alone refer to? Right, and all of God's teachings are true. If you could step back, thank you. That in God's Word, we, we know everything that we need to know to be saved, everything in Scripture that we need to know about who God is and what He's done. It's found there, and so all of our teachings are based on Scripture alone. Hunter, if you could finish us off with the last one. What does faith alone refer to? Think about God giving. That is, that is a true statement. That's correct. But remember also that in faith we are fully given everything that God has to give. Thank you. You can, you can go back to your spot. That in, in faith alone we fully receive everything that God has to give. All of those blessings. And the Holy Spirit gives us that gift of faith. We don't receive some of salvation, but we receive all of it through faith alone. Well, thank you very much for answering those questions. Now, finally, we get to hear the confirmation verses that each of them picked. Uh, Abby, if you could step forward and give us your verse, Psalm 50, verse 15. Call on me in the day of trouble. Uh, I will deliver you and you will honor me. Thank you. And Duncan, step forward for Philippians 4, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Thank you. And Alexis, Proverbs chapter, or I'm sorry, Julia. Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse 17. You have declared on this week that the Lord is your God, that you will walk in his ways, keep his decrees, commands, and laws, and that you will obey him. Thank you. 
And now Alexis, step forward for Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 6. Thank you. And Hunter, step forward for Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 29. But from there you seek the Lord your God, you will find him, you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. All right, thank you. And there you have it. It's, it's our prayer, and you'll see this in the gifts you receive after the service today. It's our prayer that you remember all of these things and your confirmation verses as you begin this next chapter of your faith life with God. That these things are the beginning tools for help you for a lifetime of understanding who God is, what he does, and who he's made you to be. Uh, let's thank them for their work, please. And now it's done and you can breathe a sigh of relief. You can go back and sit with your families. Thank you very much, everybody, for your hard work. So they knew ahead of time the questions, but they didn't know which questions they were going to be asked. So, so they, came, they came prepared. Thank you very much for doing that, everybody. Now for the rest of us, we're going to continue celebrating this, this gift of, of faith together, this gift of unity that we have as we look at all that God gives us through his word by joining together in the hymn of the day. Uh, um, please note you can find the, the tune written out in your worship folder all, or also the words are projected up on the screen. My family in Christ, my mother gave to me recently a confirmation certificate. I know you can't really see it too well. This is a confirmation certificate um, a little different than the certificates we'll be handing out uh, to the confirmands after the service. But this is the confirmation certificate of Walter Hein, my great-grandfather. He's the guy that my middle name comes from. My name is Gregory Walter Hein. You see, Walter was confirmed, he was born in 1899 and confirmed in 1913 in a Lutheran church on the north side of Milwaukee. And I wonder about Walter as I looked at that certificate and thought about our confirmants today, especially our teens. I thought about Walter memorizing all of the commandments and the explanations and memorizing the Apostles' Creed and, and Luther's explanations to those and Bible verse after Bible verse and Bible verse. I wondered if Walter ever asked the question or thought to himself, is this really all worth the effort? <laughs> Did Walter's parents think it was worth the effort to make sure that he showed up for class, to make sure he knew his Bible verses and all of his memory work, that he was prepared for examination because they did that back then too. Did Walter wonder, was it really all worth it? Would Walter wonder, is it really all worth it as he went on to continue a life of, of nurturing his faith? As he was married and, and had a son, did, did Walter think it was worth it as his son, who was named Randolph, was sick with fever as a young child and lost most of his hearing? I wonder, did Walter think it was worth it when Randolph's mother and, and Walter's wife died when Randolph was just 10. And now Walter is raising a, a half-deaf young boy all on his own. Did, did Walter think it was worth the effort? Did Walter think it was worth the effort to make sure that Randolph also went to a church and was confirmed in another Northside Milwaukee Lutheran church? Did he think it was worth the effort? Did Randolph think it was worth the effort? Did he think it was worth the effort to keep nurturing his faith and, and memorizing and keep going even as his father remarried and had another son and Randolph did not get along with either of them? Did he think it was all worth the effort? Did Randolph think it was worth the effort as he got married and had three of his own sons who made for a very lively household? <laughs> Those three boys sure did. Did Randolph think it was worth the effort to make sure that all three of those boys were confirmed at another Northside Milwaukee Lutheran church? To wrangle them all up, to, to keep them committed, to keep them going. Did, did he think it was worth it? Was it worth the effort even as, as Randolph lost his job? 
Was it worth the effort even as Randolph had multiple heart attacks and open heart surgery in a time when, when not a lot of people lived through that? Did Randolph really think it was worth the effort? Well, what about his youngest, David? <laughs> his David, who, who sometimes caused the most trouble, the most lively. Did he, wor did he think it was worth the effort as he was confirmed and went on to live a life of nurturing faith even to the point where he decided to become a pastor? Did he think it was worth the effort, even though as he looked at his ministry and put in a ton of effort, and it didn't always look like much was coming from it? As he lived a life that way, even to the, up to the point when he had a heart attack that he didn't get to walk away from like his father did. If he could tell us now, would he think it was worth the effort? Was it worth the effort of David as he had his own three kids, his youngest Gregory, who was also confirmed at a Northside Milwaukee Lutheran church? Do you think it was worth the effort? Does Gregory think it is? What about Gregory as he looks at his own two kids, not old enough to be confirmed, but both baptized? One of them baptized, where do you think? At a Northside Milwaukee Lutheran church. Does Gregory think it's worth it for, for him to put in the time to talk to them, to answer questions? Does Gregory get afraid when he looks at his two kids and wonders, are they going to think it's worth the effort? Are they going to grow up to think it's worth the effort? Is, does he look back at all of the effort through the generations that came before them? The effort of their father and his father and his father and his father. Are they going to care? Are, are they really going to care what God did for David? Are, are they really going to think about the meaning of Christmas? Are they, are they really going to long for the celebration of Easter? Are they, are they always going to care? Is it always going to be worth the effort to them? Or as they live in a world that stamps out faith and calls it foolish and stupid and gives them every reason not to believe, is their faith going to be snatched away? As they grow up, are, are they, are they going to live a life of faith, but is it going to end up being a shallow faith where, where the unexpected things happen, where, where things like what happened to their great-grandfather and their grandfather and, and their father are... When the unexpected things come, is their shallow faith going to survive? How burnt out they're going to feel? As they, as they live a life and have a life of priorities, are, are they going to let those priorities grow so much around them that it chokes out this thing that generation after generation before them thought was worth the effort, but are, are they going to see it as worth the effort? This is a thing that I was contemplating also as, as I think about these confirmants today. <laughs> Adult and teen alike, we spent a lot of time talking. We put in a lot of effort making sure we were there, schedule, studying, discussing. You had to listen to me talk over and over, geek out about church history and history and sometimes Star Wars and the food that I like. You put in the effort and you were there. And you're here today. But is it always going to be worth the effort? This is why I'm thankful for what Jesus is going to tell us today. That Jesus is going to step in as our teacher for the day. And he's going to give us a window of insight into what he considers worth the effort. What he considered worth the effort for what he did and what we should consider worth the effort for us too. And we're going to do this as we turn to Matthew chapter 13. And Jesus is going to teach this to us with a parable. A parable is this earthly picture story, but it has deep meaning. And Jesus is going to explain the meaning of this very important parable to us. And it is, it is worth the effort of listening. So please follow along as I read from Matthew chapter 13. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. 
Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil, sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a, co- a crop a, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Listen, then, to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears a message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. This is the word of Christ. Jesus gives us pictures of four different types of soil, four different images of ground. As he gives us an image of what he does as he scatters the gospel. Which of those images of soil sound the most familiar? Was the hard soil, the packed earth, where the seed falls on it and bounces off only to get eaten and snatched away? Does that sound familiar? Does it sound familiar in the life of some people around you that, that even as you talk about God, even as you talk about what you learn at church, what you've learned at Bible studies, what you discover in the Word on your own, and it just seems to bounce right off of them? Does it sound familiar? Does it sound familiar in your own life? As you hear what the law says, as the law points out not just the sin of other people, but the real and harmful sin in your own life, does it sometimes just bounce right off of you? As you hear the message of the gospel, and it becomes hard to believe that the gospel could actually forgive you and everything you've done, Sometimes that seed just bounces off of your life. What about the shallow soil? Does that sound familiar? Have you seen people in your life that, that love hearing the word and, and they love their Savior and, and they listen to it and they love it, but, but it never really leads to anything? And the unexpected things happen, just as it always has happened. There's nothing new under the sun. People get sick, loved ones are taken from us too early, jobs are lost, hardship comes, just as it always has. And when you have a faith that's shallow, it it can get burnt out by those trials, by those hardships. Do you feel it too in your life? Are you starting to feel a little bit burnt at the edges? As you go through bad news after bad news, as as you don't know what to expect tomorrow or the next week or have any idea what the next year is going to bring. But yet, do you find it hard to to really be planted deeply in God's Word? Worship happens when there's time to do it, if there's time. The Bible is opened, maybe maybe uh, maybe if I feel like it today or, or this month. But God's word becomes a distant thing because there's so much else going on. And does that sound familiar? Does it sound especially familiar when you think of that seed on on the thorny ground? Where there's just so much to do in life. There's school, there's sports, there's activities. There's relationships, there's friends, there's children, there's work, there's money to manage, the house to work on. There's so much to go on. And, and we invite it into our life. We, we make the schedules. We, we do make our own schedule. And we invite it in and we prioritize and shape the way we live. And we let those weeds 
And those thorns grow around us to the point where, where it chokes us out. We have so much anxiety over our busyness, so much stress over what we want to accomplish and haven't accomplished. Instead of being renewed and restrengthened by the Word of God and time spent with Him, as, as we see how we're yoked together with Him and He carries us, we forget about that yoke. We, we forget about the one and all, who gives us all these promises and we end, up, we end up being choked out away from the very thing we need when it does get so stressful. Does that sound familiar? If it sounds familiar to you, realize that, that Jesus sees it all. Jesus sees those people in your life. The hard soil, the shallow ground, the thorny earth. God sees it all in your life and he sees it in you too. And it's a humbling thing to realize that, that these things don't go unmissed by your Savior. They don't go unmissed by Him at all. And as He talks about all these things that can go wrong with the seed that's scattered, you start to wonder, well, is it really worth the effort? <laughs> is it really worth the effort to see the this, this seed scattered at all? And how could God think it's worth the effort if so many things could go wrong? But realize what you see in your life right now, it's nothing new. It was the same way in my great-grandfather's time. It was the same way in Jesus' time. Because what we read today with Jesus, it came at a really busy day. <laughs> a day full of miracles. He even cast a demon out. It came of a day with Pharisees trying to, to trip him up and attack him. It even came from some of his own family opposing him. It was a tired and exhausting day. And yet more and more crowds gathered. And as Jesus looked at those crowds, he knew, he knew who had hard ground. He knew who had shallow soil. He knew who was letting the thorns grow up in their lives. He knew it. And yet he did not give up on them. He saw every different kind of soil, even the hearts that were ready to listen. He saw it all and he just scattered the seed. Because he wanted that seed to go to every single person. No matter what their life was like, no matter what was going on with them, God wanted them to know the important truth that, that Jesus came to save the people with the hard-packed hearts. Jesus came to save the people who are shallow. Jesus came to save the people who are letting so much grow up in their life. Jesus came for every one of them. Jesus didn't come to save just the people who were ready and eager and have their pencil out every day to take notes. Jesus didn't just come for them. Jesus came for everybody and saw every single person as worth the effort. We know it because of this. If you could go to our next verse. In Romans it says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ saw sinners as worth the effort. Every single kind of sinner, every sinner out there was worth the effort for Christ to not give up on them. But instead for Christ to be willing to give up his own life on behalf of them. For Christ to enter a world filled with hardened hearts who rejected him, to enter into a world filled with fickle, shallow people, to enter a world that was thorny and painful. And he walked through it all and he suffered through it all because it was worth the effort to him to save sinners, to save you. God showed it's, it's always been worth the effort. We see it throughout the entire scope of the Bible. That as the prophets scattered the seed before the hardened hearts of Israelites, he thought it was worth the effort. As Jesus walked with people who knew God was important but didn't have a life that reflected it, as, as they had often lived a life uh, uh, committed to sin, Jesus showed it was worth the effort. As Jesus and the apostles continued to scatter the seed to everybody around them who, 
who had difficult lives, persecution and hardship and trials of every kind, it was never not worth the effort to scatter the seed into their life so they could know that they were worth the effort of Christ. That he wanted to bear abundant fruit in them. That because Jesus was committed to the effort of living a perfect life, suffering on the cross and rising from the dead, he could bear a an abundant harvest that we could never imagine, a harvest of of forgiveness in the life of even the most dejected sinner. That he could bear an abundant abundance of fruit, of peace in the life, even in the life of a person with, with the worst things going on imaginable. That he could produce an abundance of hope in the life of all people that that we have to admit we can't know much in this world. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what sickness will come. We don't know what success will achieve. We, we don't know what hardships are on the horizon. We can't know any of that. My grandfather didn't. My great-grandfather didn't. None of them knew, and I certainly don't know. And God doesn't ask us to know. He asks us to know one thing, who He is. Because as we see Him and know Him better, we see just how much we are worth the effort. And that that's something we can know as a fact, no matter what else is going on. It's a thing that we can cling to because of the faith planted in our hearts. Because even that faith that connects us to everything that Christ did, that faith that, that wants to grab hold of God and trust in Him above all other things, even that is a gift. If you could go to our next verse. Ephesians 2 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works that no one can boast. Even that faith that we're going to see these confirmants confess today is a gift of God. We are not celebrating a tradition today. (laughs) Because if if all that they were confessing today was was just a tradition, we wouldn't have given them much. We're not celebrating a heritage being passed down through the generations. That... That doesn't really matter. Because finally, tradition and heritage, while blessings, they they don't really mean that much in the long run. My children will never know my great-grandfather. My my children will never even know my, my father. But who my children will know and, and who I want the confirmants to know and who I want our family of peace to always know is our God who, who saw us as worth the effort. And understand the extent to which he was willing to not just talk about love, but to show love. And that's what we're celebrating today, the gift of faith. That by nature, we have a heart packed dead. We have a heart that that is always strained to being shallow. We have a heart that that willingly lets weeds grow up around us. That's how we are by nature. But by, by God's grace and the gift of the Holy Spirit, he works our hearts to good soil. And it's worth the effort for him to see that seed planted deeply into our lives and to see it grow to an abundance of his good blessings. It is, it is worth it in his eyes. And so, confirmands, my, my closing encouragement for today is this. Keep seeing it as worth the effort. Because you don't know what's going to come. I don't know what's going to happen in your life. I I don't know what's going to happen later today, let alone a year from now or 10 years now or 20 years from now. But it's my prayer that you keep knowing your God and knowing just how much worth the effort you are. Because there's only one way that you're going to get through all of those unexpected things happening. We can go to the next slide. It's by living a life like what this psalmist wrote about. He said, He whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. The seed of faith planted in your heart is going to survive those days where it's feeling packed down. It's going to survive those periods of the sun beating down. It's going to survive the birds that are going to attack you. It's going to survive the thorns that are going to grow up around you when you stay connected to that word and are firmly planted next to it. When time in God's word is worth the effort, when, when time partaking of God's sacrament is worth the effort, it, it's going to be hard to prioritize 
It's going to be hard to take the time for, but it's always going to be worth the effort because God promises to feed and strengthen you through it all so that your roots can grow deeply and you can have a life of abundant fruit by His grace. And so in the confirmation certificates that you're going to have today that, who knows, maybe you'll hand down to your great-grandson someday. It has these Bible verses in it, if you could go to our final ones. It says, So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. Your church family sees it as worth the effort to help you do this. It's why we took the time together in God's Word. It's why we're going to keep taking the time together at more worship, more Bible studies, more time spent together. Members of Peace, it's my encouragement that you see these confirmands as worth the effort. Worth the effort to get to know them, worth the effort to walk with them, worth, worth the effort to be planted with them next to the renewing and refreshing and strengthening Word of God on a regular basis. They are worth the effort. And confirmands, in return, see your church family is worth the effort. To be there with them, to walk with them, to be planted with them, to grow with them, to go with them, and produce food, uh, abundant fruit in this community together. The fruit of not just peace and joy, but of kindness and gentleness and self-control, to, to scatter that seed together is worth the effort. It's worth the effort because we know how much we are worth to our God. And we know Jesus would do the same. So as you never forget what you're worth to God, let's not forget what the gift of faith is worth to us too. Amen. Please pray with me now. Dear Heavenly Father, we give thanks that you scattered the seed of the gospel in our lives. They worked our hearts to let it be planted deeply. And so through your word, we ask that you strengthen it, grow it, and produce abundant fruit, fruit through it. And as we approach our confirmation time, we ask that you bless them and bless us as a church family. That we would continue to be planted deeply in your word, refreshed by your word, and renewed by it daily. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please know that with the offering, there are offering baskets on a table on your way out. Uh, we also have connection cards in the worship folders. If you would uh, uh, take the time to fill that out, either physically or online, we would greatly appreciate that help. But for now, at this time, I am going to ask our confirmands, both teens and adults, to step forward onto this stage today. here is good. And just watch out for this microphone cord. All right. Brothers and sisters in Christ, our Lord Jesus said to his disciples, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. In obedience to the Lord's command, you have been baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You've been taught the precious truths of the Christian faith as confessed by the Evangelical Lutheran Church. You know what God has given you by His grace and what He expects of you as His dear child. You are here to make a public confession of your Christian faith. The Apostle Paul, writing to the Romans, said, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Therefore, lift up your hearts to the God of all grace and joyfully answer these questions. 
Do you this day in the presence of God and of this congregation acknowledge that in baptism God gave you forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation? I do. Do you reject the devil along with all his lies and empty promises? I do. Do you believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit? I do. Do you believe all the books of the Bible to be the inspired word of God? Do you believe that the teaching of the Evangelical Lutheran Church, as you have learned to know it from Luther's small catechism, is faithful and true to the Word of God? Do you intend to continue steadfast in this teaching and to endure all things, even death, rather than fall away from it? I do, and I ask God to help me. Do you intend faithfully to conform all your life to the teachings of God's Word, to be faithful in the use of the Word and sacrament, and in faith and action, remain true to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as long as you live. As we ask you gathered here today to publicly confess a unity with the members of peace, I invite you now to show that unity by confessing what we believe about our God in the same way Christians have for almost 2,000 years, by reciting together both confirmants and congregation, reciting all together the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Since it is God alone who enables us both to will and to do his good pleasure, it is right for us, dear friends in Christ, to call on him for these confirmands, that he would graciously complete the good work which he has begun in them. Let us therefore bow our heads and pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for your great goodness in bringing these sons and daughters of yours to the knowledge of your Son, Jesus Christ, and in giving them both hearts to believe and mouths to confess his saving name. Enable them to bring forth the fruits of faith and to continue steadfast and victorious until the day comes when all who have fought the good fight of faith shall receive the crown of righteousness through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now let's go to our Lord together with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Our brothers and sisters in Christ, what we as a Christian congregation have here asked our Heavenly Father to confer on all of you, we now ask him to give each of you individually. Barbara, I know it's been a year. There's been much hardship and unexpected things, and yet, by the grace of God, you know where to find rest. And so it's my prayer that, as you remember your confirmation verse, you continue, continue to be carried by your God through all things in life and to find your rest in Him. So remember your Bible verses from Matthew 11. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. God bless. Carol, <laughs> I like your verse a lot because it means a lot to us at peace. <laughs> And so whatever unexpected things come your way, whatever, whatever God has planned for you, 
I'm just thankful that you know where to go. You know where to go to find, not peace, but peace. <laughs> His peace unlike anything else. And so remember your confirmation verse from John 14, verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. God's blessings. Matt, I've <laughs> had to go through a, a lot of darkness as you've helped us and been there with us as you've gotten to know us at peace. And I know you've walked through a lot in life, but you know the light. You know the source of light, and you know the source of life. And so I give thanks with you that that light and that life will shine in your life forever. And so remember now John 8, verse 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And God be with you. And Susan, <laughs> you are so smart and know so much, and yet what you've come to know and be convinced of is the most important thing. And for you to know that the love of your God and, and the blessings that your Savior has won for you are, is the one thing that no matter what happens can never be taken away. And so remember well your verses from Romans 8 verses 38 through 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Julia, you declared a lot today in the examination, and there was a lot of studying, and there was a lot of work put into this. But the most important thing for you to know is that in God, you found the one who works for you, who loves you every day, no matter what, who's there to forgive you, no matter what. And so, as you remember what he says to you, remember why he says it to you. It's, it's because he loves you. And so remember well your verse, Deuteronomy 26, verse 17. You have declared this day that the Lord is your God and that you will walk in obedience to him, that you will keep his decrees, commandments, and laws, that you will listen to him. God bless. Duncan, you picked a great verse from Philippians 4. Remember, the Apostle Paul said this because of all the unexpected things going on in his life. As he suffered, as he was jailed, as he was scared, and there was so much happening, he knew that no matter what was going on, no matter what plans he had laid out, even though they were changed, the way he'd walk in it with, in faith, no matter what was happening, was because of Christ. So remember this verse in the strength of Christ from Philippians 4.13. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. And Hunter... So thankful for the time that we had being in God's Word and seeking to know Him better and all the questions, <laughs> all of the questions that we had to go through. It was a tremendous time. And, and so as you remember your confirmation, remember to keep asking those questions, keep seeking God, keep seeking to know Him better because what you'll just keep finding is a God who loves you tremendously. And so remember Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 29. But if from there you seek the Lord your God, you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. God bless him. Hey, Abby, <laughs> what a crazy year <laughs> with many crazy years to come, ones that you don't even know or can't even predict. But as talented as you are and, and how much you have going on in your life there may be, remember you always have a place to turn to. It's your God whom you've come to know, and you've come to know him very well. It's a God that I hope you never forget, and, and remember to include in, in a busy life and a packed life, but a God who is your life. Remember your verse from Psalm 50, verse 15. Call on me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you will honor me. God bless. And Alexis, your verse is from Proverbs 3. It, it reflects a heart that, that knows there's a lot to trust in. <laughs> there's a lot of things in your life that ask for your trust and, and a lot of things that maybe we're tempted to trust in, but there's one thing alone that makes our paths straight that leads us all the way to heaven. 
It's the one that no matter how much life changes, because you know full well how much life can change. And no matter who lets us down and who picks us up again, it's, it's one thing that you can trust in. It's, it's the commitment of your God. And no matter else who is around, no matter else what is happening, it, your God is there. Let's so remember well your verses from Proverbs 3. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your path straight. God's blessings to you. Your church now invites you, friends, to receive the sacrament of the Lord's body and blood whenever it is offered. Accept this invitation with deep reverence and holy joy. Regard your communing at the Lord's table as a precious privilege given you by God through his church. Receive this sacrament thankfully and often. The almighty and most merciful God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless and keep you now. Thank you. you Maybe see. It. And now we'll receive together the Lord's blessing. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you, be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. I ask you to please stand for a closing hymn.